Hey guys, I took a little trip to Cincinnati, Ohio a couple weekends ago and came back with two TVs. One is a Motorola 12K2, but it turns out the cabinet was infested by wood bores, I think they're called. Uh, these little holes were all over the cabinet and uh, I, I figured it was infested with something and when I asked online they said, uh, yeah, that's bad and to get it out of the house. So I've got it outside and I'm waiting on some insecticide. I'll fumigate the cabinet. Once I do, I'll bring it inside and record a video. I'm hoping that I can patch up all those little holes with some uh, wood putty and then refinish the cabinet. Anyways, this is the other set. That's a GE810. Uh, from 1949, it's a 10 inch set. Here's the front. Uh, as usual, it's missing a knob, uh, but this set isn't all that uncommon, so I don't think I'll have too much trouble finding a replacement. Far right here, we have brightness and contrast, and then horizontal and vertical, and here's a channel selector, which is a little unusual. We have channels. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it's eight dash nine, ten dash eleven, and twelve dash thirteen. When you get from seven to eight, it's actually a jump in the frequency band, and uh, uh, these uh, the eight through thirteen are actually a, a bit higher in frequency. And uh, I guess with the way they set up the tuner in this, with the fine tuning, you can actually span all the way from one station to the other in one switch position and finally this is the on off volume and focus it's a nice GE logo and down here General Electric Television nice thing about this set is that unlike most 10 inch sets of that era um, it uses a better picture tube most use a 10 BP4 well, this has a 10 FP4 which uh, is illuminized and it gives you a much brighter picture Cabinet's in kind of rough shape, but most of the veneer is here, and it's it's not uh, separating badly or anything. So I think it just needs a a nice refinishing. Here's the back side. Nice to have the actual back. Most old vintage sets you find the back is missing. Servicemen had to go in there all the time to pull to check on tubes and replace parts and whatnot. And plus, these are just made out of masonite, so. Uh, they can get damaged and start falling apart quite easily. Let's pop off the back and see what's inside. Dirty, but then again, every old set's always dirty. Well, now I know where the power cord is. Somebody stuck this inside ages ago. Now here's where the power cord would connect. I call this the safety interlock. The idea being that when you pull off the back, the cord is supposed to be connected to the square hole right here. So when you pull off the back, the cord actually comes out of the set. Uh, but quite often you find them like this, or you can buy cheater cords. So you can plug in the TV without the back being in. This one, you can see it's really corroded, and it's just as corroded on the corresponding sock on the back of the TV and one of the pins is actually completely gone so there's no way that anybody could actually plug this in and, and power it up so I'll have to pull the chassis out and replace this whole connector with something that uh, you know <laughs> has doesn't have that pin missing and isn't so corroded now as for the rest of the set looks to be looks like all the tubes are there speaker picture tube and the picture tube is intact. Um, if you find one that has a neck broken, the front of the picture tube will be look like, kind of like a cat's eye. Uh, when the tubes break, they implode, and the shock wave will like, blow the phosphor right off the front of the picture tube. So it's very very noticeable. Uh, but this one's not cracked, and uh, see all the tubes seem to be here. It's going to be in pretty good shape. There is a hole down there, but doesn't look like a tube socket was removed or anything. I'll have to refer to the schematic and double check on that. Yeah, first thing I'd like to check on these is to see if the picture tube is good because it's one of the more expensive things to either have rebuilt or replaced. Be very careful when you pull these sockets off because these plugs can oftentimes get loose and there's a, there's a 
the tube is glass and then this is uh, plastic and they're, they're bonded together and quite often that bond breaks but this one's pretty tight. If they are loose, a real simple remedy is to just take some super glue and disperse it and a capillary action will pull it into the gap between the plastic and the glass. Wait a few minutes and you'll have a nice tight bond. All right, like I said, the next thing I like to do is check the picture tube. So I pulled out a couple of my testers. The first one I have is BNK 440, which is a bit old. It's uh, like circa early 60s, I think. It's got all the all the basic models, and I've got the full adapter set, so I can certainly test this picture tube with it. Um, and it takes a little while for it to heat up and. These are three neon bulbs here, and it'll, uh, if the tube is good, all three will light up halfway. There's a little chart on the inside here. Or I should say the first one will be off, and the second one will be a half moon. G1 is a half moon, and G2 is a half moon. And there's other various patterns of the neon tube being fully off, fully on, half on, half off, to indicate shorts between the elements. Uh, a few things you can test with this. One is to check for shorts, like I just mentioned. Two, you can check the emission, just like with any vacuum tube, and the meter will read into the good or bad range depending on, um, you know, how, how strong the tube is. You can check the cutoff. Um, when you do that, you turn the center knob, and it will indicate basically if the tube, if you have some grid control which is a good indication of how uh, sharp the contrast is going to be. Now if there are shorts, there is a tool to remove shorts. And if the emission is low, it does have a rejuvenation mode. What that basically does is it charges up a capacitor, low, medium, or high. And you push the, uh, the red button over there, the dynamic intensifier button. And that will blast the charge in the capacitor through the cathode on the tube. The idea being uh, the cathode material can, uh, well, I guess, build sort of build up sort of an oxide layer, and by giving it a blast, you can blow that clean and expose some fresh cathode material surface. But I've been warned that items this old, or I should say, re rejuvenators that are this old, were pretty crude, and you can easily uh, just blow away the entire cathode surface. So I don't use this one for rejuvenation. Uh, what I do use is this, which is kind of a Cadillac of uh, CRT testers and rejuvenators, which is a Sencor CR70. If you look on eBay, you may find one and it can be quite pricey. This one I got, I think, for 20 bucks because it's missing all of the adapters. But uh, it doesn't really bother me because most of the tubes that I care about, if you look on this chart here, like this is the 10 FP4, which is right here. But you can see this whole block of all the 10 inch tubes. For socket they all say UA, which is universal adapter. Which means you don't use one of the adapter sockets anyways. What you use is this. Which I'm missing, but I was certain I can certainly make my own quite easily given this diagram. So what comes out of the tester is this cable they have illustrated here. Which, which are numbered in really oddball fashion, which is why I couldn't do anything until I, somebody online was nice enough to give me a copy of this. Once you know the numbering system, it's quite easy to run a wire from this to the corresponding CRT pin. And you then set up the tester to go to those pins. So the cathode, for example, is pin 11, grid 1 is pin 2, grid 2 is pin 10, and so on. Set the uh, CRT type for video, set the filament as indicated, and so on and so forth. I'll put the camera down for a few minutes and get this set up and I'll show you how it works.